Welcome to a journey through America's national parks, a testament to the sheer majesty and beauty of nature. These lands, preserved for their unparalleled splendor, are home to some of the most awe-inspiring vistas and diverse wildlife on the planet. From the towering peaks of the Rockies to the serene valleys of the Smokies, our national parks are treasures to be explored and cherished. They invite adventurers, nature lovers, and families alike to immerse themselves in their natural wonder. But amidst this beauty, there lies an untold side of these vast wilderness areas, a side that is mysterious and unsettling. In the depths of these parks, strange and unexplained events have occurred, events that continue to puzzle experts and visitors alike. There have been numerous accounts of people who ventured into these parks only to disappear without a trace. These aren't just stories, they are real life mysteries, leaving families and search teams grappling for answers in the vast expanse of the wild. As we delve into the beauty and grandeur of our national parks, we also explore these perplexing mysteries. Join us as we uncover the tales of the unexplained and the vanished, a reminder of the respect and caution these natural wonders command. This is not just a journey through nature's artistry. It's a deeper exploration into the heart of America's national parks, a journey where beauty meets mystery. Harry Mahone, a 21-year-old college student, was a beacon of promise at San Benito Junior College. His intelligence and athletic proudness set him apart, and his leadership skills shone brightly in his role as the president of the student body. While the details of his early life and upbringing remain somewhat obscure, it's clear from his standing among his peers and professors that Harry was a well-respected and much admired figure on campus. On December 18, 1925, in the spirit of adventure and camaraderie, Harry, alongside two of his close friends from his days at Hollister High School, Jeff Newark and Russell Hawkins, embarked on a bear hunting expedition. Their destination was the rugged and picturesque Sierra Nevada Mountains, right on the cusp of Yosemite National Park. This excursion was not just a hunt, it was a celebration of their friendship during the holiday season, a chance to bond away from the pressures of college life. The trio set up their base camp in a secluded area nestled between Hazel Green and Gin Flat, not far from the stunning vistas of the Yimmy Valley. The location was strategic, offering them a good vantage point for their hunt and easy access to the surrounding wilderness. Here, amidst the tranquility of nature, they made their plans for the hunt. The strategy was simple yet effective, split up to cover more ground, thereby increasing their chances of encountering a black bear. Jeff, always the most eager and impulsive of the three, was the first to venture out. He had a specific area in mind and wanted to waste no time in setting off. Meanwhile, Harry and Russell lingered at the camp, finalizing their approach. After a while, they too embarked on separate paths, agreeing to maintain a reasonable distance from each other, but still within the same general vicinity. As the day unfolded, an unforeseen challenge arose. A fierce snowstorm began to sweep over the mountains, transforming the landscape into a treacherous and unforgiving environment. Jeff, sensing the change in weather, hurried back to the campsite. He arrived to find Harry and Russell still missing. Concerned but hopeful, Jeff waited, trusting in their wilderness skills and expecting them to return as the storm intensified. Russell eventually made his way back, but there was no sign of Harry. The clock ticked past their agreed-upon meeting time of 5 p.m., and with each passing minute, worry turned into fear. Two hours later, with the snow falling heavier, Russell and Jeff knew they had to act. They re-entered the forest, braving the worsening conditions, calling out for Harry, firing shots into the air in hopes of guiding him back to safety. As night fell and their efforts yielded no response, the gravity of the situation became clear. Despite Harry's proficiency in survival skills and his familiarity with scout law, something had gone awry. The friends had made the difficult decision to seek help, leading them to a nearby ranger station. What followed was an extensive and exhaustive search effort. 
a team of 25 consisting of park rangers, professional searchers, and volunteers comb the area. They retrace the steps taken by Russell and Jeff, pushing further into the wilderness, hoping to find any sign of Harry. The search was met with silence. As days turned into weeks, hope dimmed. In a tragic turn of events, it wasn't until June of 1926, six months after his disappearance, that the mystery of Harry's whereabouts was partially solved. His remains were discovered near Gin Flat by Roscoe Wright and William Scove, friends of the Mahone family. The body was found at the bottom of a steep cliff, a position that raised more questions than answers. An abrasion on his shoulder hinted at a violent impact, and the discovery of his sweater, a mere ten feet away from his body, suggested a struggle or an attempt to survive the harsh conditions. The coroner concluded that Harry's death was accidental, but the specific causes remain unknown. This conclusion, however, did little to quell the whispers of foul play or the theories of an accidental fall or hypothermia. The fact that his body was found in an area previously searched multiple times fueled speculations of him being placed there. Further adding to the intrigue were reports of a clairvoyance involvement, leading to the discovery of a shallow grave and empty cartridges near Hazel Green. These findings, though never officially linked to Harry's case, cast a shadow of doubt and mystery over the entire investigation. As the years passed, the case of Harry Mahone became a topic of local legend and speculation. Theories ranged from animal attacks to accidental falls, from survival gone wrong to sinister human intervention. But the truth, obscured by time and the elements, remained as elusive as the snowflakes that blanketed the Sierra Nevada on that fateful December day. Harry's story of friendship, adventure, and mystery left a mark on the community the search for answers continued in the aftermath of the discovery of Harry's remains. The involvement of private detectives, spurred by the Mahone family's relentless quest for closure, introduced new but inconclusive elements to the narrative. The detectives following leads from a clairvoyant unearthed contradictory evidence, including a sweater believed to have belonged to Harry found at a distant ranch and a shallow grave near Hazel Green. These findings, though intriguing, only deepen the enigma surrounding Harry's fate. Amidst the swirling theories and growing folklore, two camps of thought emerged. One group believed that Harry, overwhelmed by the sudden snowstorm, might have succumbed to hypothermia following a fall. They argued that the abrasion on his shoulder and the position of his body supported this theory. This group pointed to the harsh and unpredictable nature of the Sierra Nevadas as the likely culprit in Harry's demise. On the other side were those who suspected foul play. This theory was bolstered by the mysterious circumstances surrounding the discovery of his body and the peculiar findings the private detectives had found. The possibility that Harry had encountered someone with ill intentions or had been caught in a situation far beyond a simple hunting mishap could not easily be dismissed. Polygraph tests, a novel and unproven method at the time, added another layer of complexity and intrigue. Jeff's passing of the test seemed to have absolved him from any direct involvement, but Russell's inability to take the test, due to his parents' skepticism of its accuracy, left questions unanswered. The lack of concrete evidence, coupled with the limitations of forensic science at the time, meant that speculation continued to thrive in the absence of definitive answers. As the years passed, the case of Harry Mahone faded from the headlines, but it never disappeared from the collective memory of the community. The mystery of this disappearance and death continue to be a topic of discussion, a cautionary tale of the unpredictability of nature and the frailty of human life in the face of nature's raw power. The legacy of Harry Mahone is one of enduring mystery and unresolved questions. His story, a blend of youthful exuberance, adventure, and an untimely end, remains a reminder of the mysteries that still linger in the wild, untamed spaces of the world. In the end, the saga of Harry Mahone, much like the snow-covered peaks of the Sierra Nevada, remains shrouded in mystery, a puzzle still waiting to be solved. In the rural expanse of Wasara County, Wisconsin, 
A dense fog enshrouded the landscape on a cold October morning in 1956. This day would mark a departure from the usual tranquility of Auroraville, a small town where community ties were strong and life was predictably serene. It was here, amidst this quiet backdrop, that a bewildering event occurred. The mysterious disappearance of 16-year-old Judy Rodenkall from her family's remote farmhouse. Judy's day began as any typical school day. She woke up early, prepared for school, a routine she had followed countless times. However, this day, the last of October, would unfold in a manner far from ordinary. Judy never made it to her school bus, nor did she arrive at school. Her sudden absence sent shockwaves to the close-knit community, prompting an extensive search operation involving local law enforcement, volunteers, and even aircraft. Judy, known in the community as a quiet, pleasant girl, was not one to seek attention or cause worry. Her disappearance was completely out of character, which added to the urgency and concern of the situation. Her boyfriend, a constant in her simple life, was instrumental in raising the alarm. His arrival at the Rodenkall farmhouse and the subsequent discovery of Judy's absence triggered immediate action, leading to a widespread search that gripped the entire town and beyond. Initially, the sheriff's office approached Judy's disappearance as a potential case of a missing person, perhaps even a runaway. However, this theory was quickly overshadowed by doubts raised by statements from her family and boyfriend. They described Judy as being in high spirits, looking forward to her school day, which made the likelihood of her voluntary running away seem implausible. The lack of any clear motive for her to leave home, coupled with her cheerful demeanor, shifted the focus of the investigation towards the disturbing possibility of foul play. As the search operation intensified into the second day, a significant development occurred. Bloodhounds, specially brought in from La Crosse, led the search party to a bridge over Willow Creek, located east of Highway 49. The creek, typically shallow on the side of the highway, became the focal point after the dogs picked up a scent from two socks and a handkerchief identified as Judy's. These items were found a considerable distance from her home, about a mile northwest, deepening the mystery and expanding the search area. Despite this promising lead, the trail abruptly went cold at the creek. The bloodhounds, instrumental in locating the socks, suddenly lost interest and were unable to continue the scent trail. This unexpected cessation puzzled the searchers and was uncharacteristic of the trained dogs. The creek was thoroughly dragged for about a half mile, yet no evidence of Judy's presence was uncovered. The situation took an even more perplexing turn when, after nearly 60 hours of being missing, Judy was discovered by Edgar Tim, a local farmer. She emerged from the woods, disoriented and barefoot, collapsing unconscious at the doorstep of his farmhouse. She was immediately taken to the hospital, where Dr. David Sfer reported that Judy was in relatively good physical condition, though suffering from shock and exposure. Upon regaining consciousness, Judy was unable to recall any details of her time missing, leaving a significant gap in the timeline of events. The sheriff speculated that Judy might have spent the entirety of her disappearance in an outbuilding on Edgar's farm, but this theory raised more questions than it answered. The mystery of Judy's missing shoes remained unsolved. Despite exhaustive searches by teams and bloodhounds in the area around Willow Creek, Edgar's farm, and the surrounding woods, no trace of her shoes was ever found. The discovery of her socks without the shoes added an eerie and unexplained element to the case. In the wake of the search, the community was left grappling with various theories and unanswered questions. Some residents speculated about a possible encounter in the woods, perhaps with someone or something that caused Judy to become disoriented and lose her memory. Others considered the possibility of a psychological episode, potentially triggered by unknown stressors or environmental factors. The unusual behavior of the bloodhounds at the creek bridge, the unexplained discovery of her socks, and the absence of her shoes only deepened the mystery. 
As time passed, Judy's baffling disappearance and equally mysterious reappearance continued to be a subject of discussion, speculation, and local legend in Wasara County. The case, with its strange developments and lack of conclusive answers, remain a puzzling chapter in Auroraville's history, a puzzling reminder of the unexpected and often inexplicable mysteries that can occur even in the most serene and remote communities. The story of Judy Rodenkow stands as an unsolved riddle, a testament to the enduring mystery of human experiences and the limits of our understanding of them. In the spring of 1999, Mount Rainier, a towering and majestic peak in the Cascade Range of Washington State, became the site of a series of mysterious and tragic events. These events began with the disappearance of John Ripker, a 51-year-old experienced climber who ventured to the mountain with his climbing team on May 16th of 1999. The team, a close-knit group of friends and seasoned climbers, had set their sights on the Moon Snow Field, a challenging and treacherous route situated 8,000 feet up on the 14,410-foot mountain. John's disappearance under unclear circumstances remains one of the most baffling aspects of the incident. During their descent from the mountain, amidst conditions of low visibility, John became separated from the group. The exact sequence of events leading to his separation is not known, but the team only realized he was missing when John contacted them via radio, stating that he was lost. This revelation, occurring at an elevation of about 8,000 feet, marked the beginning of a frantic search effort. The search for John garnered significant media attention. Reports from the Centralia Chronicle on May 19, 1999, detailed the challenging conditions faced by the search parties. A team of 33 searchers, supported by a helicopter, scoured the area between the moon snow field and Paradise Glacier. The operation was hindered by low temperatures, strong winds, heavy precipitation, and poor visibility, all typical of the harsh conditions on Mount Rainier. Despite these challenges, there was hope for finding John, given his experience as a climber who had previously summited Mount Rainier and his preparedness, indicated by his possessions of essential climbing gear and backpack. Months after John's disappearance, in September of 1999, a startling discovery was made. The Walla Walla Union Bulletin reported the recovery of a body on Mount Rainier, believed to be that of John Ripker. Notably, the body was spotted by a helicopter pilot who had participated in the initial search for John. The pilot observed clothing consistent with what John was known to have worn, although specific details about the clothing were not reported. Intriguingly, this discovery occurred in an area that had been extensively searched during the initial rescue efforts, raising questions about the timing of John's movements or the possibility that he was overlooked by the searchers. The year 1999 also witnessed the tragic disappearance of William Thayer, a 27-year-old medical doctor with a passion for outdoor adventure. On June 20th of 1999, William embarked on a hike to Camp Muir, situated at 10,000 feet on Mount Rainier. The conditions that day were overcast, with a mild fog, but not considered severe enough to impede visibility significantly. William, an experienced outdoorsman, was expected to descend safely from Camp Muir. However, he vanished without a trace, and extensive search operations involving professional dog teams, helicopters, and park rangers turned up no clues to his whereabouts. Two years after his disappearance, a chance discovery led to the recovery of William's remains. Rangers found his snowboard and other equipment, followed by his body, near Nisquilly Glacier at 5,800 feet beneath a waterfall. This location, off the typical descent path, provoked numerous questions. The reasons behind William's decision to travel towards the waterfall, whether he got lost or had an accident, remained a matter of speculation. Furthermore, 1999 also saw the disappearance of Cliss Hartones and Raymond Vicali, experienced climbers who went missing while attempting to reach Camp Mir with their friend Frank Valenzil. The group decided to split up due to Frank's slower pace, hindered by a cumbersome sled. 
Chris and Raymond pressed ahead, but this was the last time anyone saw them. The search for Chris and Raymond involved helicopters and ground teams, but no trace of the pair was found, adding to the series of unresolved mysteries on Mount Rainier that year. Reflecting on the events of 1999, the Centralia Chronicle described it as a particularly challenging and frustrating year for Mountain Rainier's search teams. The park conducted 17 major search and rescue operations, costing nearly a quarter of a million dollars, about five times the average of the annual expenditures. The search operations were often hampered by extreme weather conditions, which are common on Mount Rainier, but seemed particularly severe that year. Despite deploying dogs, search teams, and considerable resources, the rangers and volunteers faced disappointment and frustration, as many of these searches ended without resolution. The incidents on Mount Rainier in 1999 underscore the unpredictability and perilous nature of mountain climbing. Even experienced climbers like John Ripker, William Vare, Chris Hartones, and Raymond Vicali can find themselves at the mercy of the mountain's harsh conditions and vast wilderness. The mysteries of their disappearances serves as a somber reminder of the inherent risks involved in mountaineering and the profound unpredictability of nature. The story of these climbers remain a testament to the puzzle of Mount Rainier and the mysteries that the wilderness can conceal. The case of John Ripker, in particular, highlights the critical importance of maintaining close contact with fellow climbers, especially in areas of low visibility and challenging terrain. The fact that John was able to communicate via radio after becoming separated offered a glimmer of hope, but the failure to locate him, despite this advantage, underscores the complexities and dangers inherent in mountaineering. The discovery of his body months later in a previously searched area raised questions about the effectiveness of search operations in such rugged and variable conditions. William Vare's case was equally perplexing. His passion for outdoor activities and his medical background suggested a higher level of awareness and preparedness for such an expedition. The discovery of his body beneath a waterfall, away from the expected descent route, suggested an unusual deviation from his planned path. This deviation could have been caused by disorientation, an accident, or an unknown factor that compelled him to change his course drastically. The disappearance of Chris Hartone and Raymond Vicali added another layer of mystery to the events of that year. The decision to split the group, while not uncommon in mountaineering, can introduce significant risks, especially when unexpected conditions arise. The absence of any clues or traces of Chris and Raymond, despite extensive and repeated searches, illustrates the challenges faced by search and rescue teams in such a vast and unforgiving environment. The high number of unresolved cases on Mount Rainier in 1999 also prompted introspection and analysis among the park's search and rescue teams. It raised questions about the limitations of existing search methods and the need for more advanced techniques and technologies in mountain search and rescue operations. The frustration expressed by the chief ranger and the operations leader of the Tacoma Mountain Rescue reflected the emotional toll these unsolved cases had on the involved in the search efforts. These incidents serve as a sombering reminder of the respect and caution that Mount Rainier demands from those who seek to explore its slopes. They highlight the need for meticulous planning, constant vigilance, and the importance of being prepared for the unpredictable nature of the mountain environment. The stories of John Ripker, William Vare, Chris Artones, Raymond Vicali, and others who have disappeared on Mount Rainier continue to resonate within the climbing community, serving as cautionary tales about the risks and uncertainties of mountaineering. As adventurers continue to be drawn to the allure of Mount Rainier, these unresolved mysteries remain a testament to the mountain's awe-inspiring beauty and its equally formidable dangers. Lake Wenatchee, a majestic and serene body of water fed by glaciers and snowmelt, lies in the heart of the Wenatchee National Forest on the eastern slopes of the Cascade Mountain Range. It was here, in this captivating landscape, that a mystery unfolded, the disappearance of Hildegard Hedrickson in June of 2013. 
Hildegard, a distinguished 79-year-old mycologist, originally from Germany, had a long and storied career. Having moved to the United States for her education, she excelled academically at the University of Washington, earning a bachelor's, master's, and doctorate degree. Her field of expertise was mycology. The study of fungi was more than just a profession. It was her passion. She was known for her remarkable skill in identifying an array of mushrooms, including the most elusive species. Her work at the Center for Urban Horticulture was a testament to her dedication and expertise. On June 8, 2013, Hildegard embarked on what was supposed to be a routine expedition. She drove to an area approximately 15 miles from Lake Winnetachi, parking near the Minnow Creek Trailhead, close to Basal Peak. This region, having been affected by wildfires the previous year, was a promising site for mushroom growth, a phenomenon often observed in post-wildfire environments. Hildegard, despite her advanced age, was undeterred by the physical challenges of the terrain. Her goal was to explore, collect, and study post-fire fungal flora. The day progressed with Hildegard meeting several individuals along the trail. Among them were fellow mushroom enthusiasts, a Forest Service employee, and notably, another doctor, a cardiologist who expressed concern about Hildegard's ability to safely navigate the steep and potentially treacherous trail. Hildegard, however, was confident in her hiking abilities, reassuring him of her experience in regular hiking routine. As Hildegard ventured deeper into the forest with her trusty blue metallic walking stick and mushroom basket in hand, little did anyone know that this would be the last time she would ever be seen. The trail, while familiar to many, held unseen dangers, and at some point during her solitary hike, an incident occurred that led to her complete disappearance. It wasn't until three days later that the gravity of the situation came to light. Another mushroom hunter, noticing Hildegard's car parked in the same location for an extended period, found it unlocked with her purse still inside. The discovery prompted an immediate call to 911, and a large-scale search operation was launched. The response was swift and extensive. Bloodhound teams, deputies, professional search and rescue personnel, and volunteers all joined forces. They combed the area thoroughly, with the dogs retracing Hildegard's steps along the trail and beyond. Despite their efforts, the dogs failed to pick up her scent, an unusual occurrence given the known starting point of her hike. The search operation was bolstered by advanced technology, including a helicopter equipped with thermal imaging. However, even this sophisticated equipment failed to locate Hildegard. During the search, one of the volunteers reported hearing a mysterious whistling sound, which led to a redirected focus in that area. Despite this potential lead, the source of the sound was never identified, and it did not bring them any closer to finding Hildegard. The perplexing nature of Hildegard's disappearance was underscored by Deputy Jean Ellis of the County Sheriff's Office. With 24 years of experience under his belt, he had never seen a case like this, a complete absence of clues, leads, or any trace of the missing person. The mystery deepened given Hildegard's physical limitations. She relied on a walking stick, suggesting that she couldn't have strayed very far from the trail. Several theories emerged in the wake of the fruitless search. Some speculated about possible encounters with commercial mushroom pickers. Hildegard, known for her strong opinions in her field, may have inadvertently provoked a confrontation. However, this theory, like others, lacked any concrete evidence. The mystery of the whistling sound also remained unresolved. Was it a signal from illegal foragers or an unrelated natural phenomenon? As the time passed, the case of Hildegard Hendrickson became a haunting enigma. The extensive search efforts involving numerous individuals and advanced technology yielded nothing. The Cascade Mountain Range, known for its beauty and treachery, seemed to have concealed the fate of a seasoned mycologist within its depths. Ten years later, the questions surrounding her disappearance remain unanswered, a testament to the unpredictability and often inscrutable nature of the wild. 
in the expansive and often unpredictable wilderness of Sequoia National Park, the disappearance of Philip Arns in September of 2005 stands out as a particularly mystifying case, marked by a frustrating lack of information and understanding. Philip, a 42-year-old outdoor enthusiast, embarked on what was supposed to be a routine, multi-day hiking trip with his brother, starting from Mineral King. The journey, initially planned as a loop to return to their starting point, took an unexpected turn when Philip began feeling unwell. This unforeseen health issue prompted a change in their plans, leading them to exit the hike at a different trailhead. At this point, Philip's brother made a crucial decision. He instructed Philip to stay put while he hitchhiked back to their parked car, intending to drive back and pick Philip up. Philip, equipped with his backpack containing essential supplies and water, agreed to wait. However, this seemingly straightforward plan would soon unravel into a perplexing mystery. The brothers' round trip took approximately five hours, a significant duration which Philip was left alone in a remote area. Upon his return, Philip's brother was confronted with a deeply unsettling scene. The area where he had left Philip was now devoid of any sign of him. Despite extensive searching in the surrounding forest and repeated calls, there was no response, no trace of Philip. The solitude of the area at the time Philip was left alone only deepened the mystery. The search efforts initially focused near Crescent Meadow, where Philip was last seen. The search narrowed to Sugar Pine Trail after search teams found Philip's sunglasses, an indication that he had been in that area. Alexandra Picavet of the National Park Service described the search terrain as challenging, with dense vegetation and steep embankments complicating the efforts. Despite the deployment of over 40 ground searchers, mounted patrols, dog teams, employees, volunteers, and a helicopter crew, the search proved difficult. Tragically, Philip's body was eventually discovered late on a Saturday near Crescent Creek, less than a mile from the Crescent Meadow parking area, at the bottom of a steep embankment. Officials speculated that exposure might have been the cause of death, though a conclusive official cause was never publicly released. The discovery came three days after his disappearance, and notably, there was no mention of any injuries, such as those that might be sustained in a fall adding to the puzzle. The most baffling aspect of this case is why Philip felt compelled to leave the spot where he was waiting for his brother. Given his unwell condition and the fact that he was equipped with supplies and water, it seems illogical for him to choose to venture into rugged and hazardous terrain in the surrounding areas. The presence of his sunglasses on the trail hinted at either a deliberate or hurried departure, raising questions about his state of mind or external factors that might have influenced his decision. Was there a sense of fear or discomfort that prompted Philip to move away from the relative safety of the parking area? The lack of evidence of any animal attack or any visible injuries on his body upon discovery ruled out some of the potential explanations, leaving room for more questions than answers. Philip was described by his family as an avid backpacker and climber experienced in various outdoor activities. This background makes his decision to leave his waiting spot even more perplexing. His experience and comfort in the outdoors suggests that he would understand the risks of moving away from a known location, especially while unwell and awaiting his brother's return. In the absence of further information and detailed reporting, the case of Philip Arendt remains an unsolved mystery, an example of how a person, for reasons unknown, can inexplicably disappear into the wilderness under seemingly benign circumstances. The story serves as a reminder of the unpredictability and the potential dangers inherent in natural environments, where even the most experienced outdoorsmen can find themselves in perilous situations. Philip's case, with its missing pieces and unanswered questions, continues to haunt those who seek to understand the mysteries hidden within the vast expanse of our national parks. The Disappearance of Barbara McGee, a 38-year-old woman in the dense and mysterious wilderness of Sequoia National Park, presents a case shrouded in uncertainty and unanswered questions. 
On June 22nd of 1965, Barbara embarked on a solo vacation, seeking solace and perhaps adventure in the giant forest area, not far from Crescent Meadow. This location is notably close to where Philip Arians would disappear years later, adding a layer of intrigue into the area's history. Barbara's plan for a week-long retreat, however, took a dark turn, leading her to become one of the many perplexing disappearances in this national park. Barbara's decision to not regularly update anyone on her status during her stay meant that her absence went unnoticed for a significant period. It was only realized that she was missing when she failed to return home as scheduled, and she wasn't reported missing until a week after her expected return. This delay critically hampered the early stages of the search effort. The initial search operation, spanning two days, yielded no clues to Barbara's whereabouts. Rangers found her personal belongings, including her pocketbook and money in her cabin, alongside a large quantity of uneaten food. This discovery indicated that Barbara had spent very little time in the cabin before vanishing into the park. The realization that she likely disappeared within hours of her arrival meant that she had been missing for an entire week before the search even began, complicating the search efforts significantly. District Ranger Paul Turner noted that the neighbors in the nearby cabins hadn't seen Barbara since her arrival. The lack of immediate concern from neighbors was not unusual, as solo travelers often seek solitude and privacy in these settings. There was no apparent reason to suspect anything was amiss. The search operation escalated when professional mountain climbers were airlifted into the Panther Gap area, leading to the high altar peak following a reported sighting of Barbara. A hiker had reported seeing a woman matching Barbara's description on the day of her arrival, asking for directions to Altar Peak Trail. After the brief interaction, Barbara reportedly headed off in the direction indicated by the hiker. Given the time that had passed since her disappearance, the search teams were bracing for the possibility of recovering a body. The focus of the search included the Crescent Meadow area, which would also be the site of Philip Arians' disappearance years later. Despite thorough searches of all the trails within the giant forest, not a single clue was found, leading searchers to believe that Barbara wasn't in that area. The search then shifted to Crescent Meadow. What perplexed the search teams was the complete absence of any sighting of Barbara after she received directions. Considering the well-traveled nature of the trails, it seemed highly unlikely that she could have vanished without anyone noticing her presence. This led to speculation that something unexpected must have occurred shortly after her last confirmed sighting. As the search continued, frustration grew among the search team. Animal predation was considered unlikely, as such incidents usually leave behind evidence. Likewise, there was no apparent indication of foul play. The search teams found it implausible that Barbara would have unintentionally strayed from the trail, given the immediate ruggedness of the terrain off the marked paths. This raised questions similar to those in Philip's case. Why would Barbara leave the trail, and what could have motivated her to venture into more hazardous terrain? After extensive and fruitless searching, the decision was made to restart the search from the beginning, focusing on the area within the two-mile radius of Barbara's cabin. Despite a meticulous and comprehensive approach, retracing all previous efforts, the search again yielded no results. Barbara's disappearance remains an unsolved mystery, with no trace of her ever found. Barbara McGee's story is a reminder of the unpredictable nature of the wilderness and the importance of safety precautions and communicating your plans to friends or loved ones. Her case serves as a cautionary tale, highlighting the need for anyone venturing into remote and rugged terrains to have a solid plan for regular check-ins and communication. The disappearance of Barbara McGee, like many others in national parks, leaves a legacy of mystery and a reminder of the vast, untamed beauty and mysteries that these natural landscapes hold. The Baffling Disappearance of Mitchell Dale Sterling, a 51-year-old experienced hiker in Mesa Verde National Park, Colorado, is a case that has remained puzzling and unsolved. 
Mesa Verde, renowned for its rich history and archaeological significance, is home to over 5,000 ancient landmarks, including 600 cliff dwellings, watchtowers, and petroglyphs left behind by ancient people. The reasons for their abrupt departure from this region remain a topic of intrigue and speculation, much like the disappearance of Dale Sterling himself. In the summer of 2005, Dale, along with his wife and parents, traveled from Texas through Colorado. This trip, emblematic of their love for hiking and outdoor adventures, took an unexpected turn due to car troubles, leading them to Mesa Verde National Park. This unplanned visit occurred on a warm summer day with clear skies, offering perfect conditions for exploring the park. Upon reaching the park's visitor center around 4.30 p.m., Dale decided to venture out to see the Spruce Treehouse Ruins, a notable archaeological site approximately 400 meters from the visitor center. Expecting a quick visit, Dale set off without water, underestimating the time that he would be away. The events following Dale's departure from the visitor center are cloaked in mystery. At a trail of intersection, one path led to Spruce Tree House, while the other diverged to Petroglyph Point Trail. This trail, longer and more rugged, featured various cliff edges and steeper climbs, but was not typically considered dangerous. Despite its challenges, the Petroglyph Point Trail is a popular hiking route, particularly from March through November, known for its scenic views and historical significance. Dale was last seen on the Petroglyph Point Trail by a family who had a brief, pleasant interaction with him. This encounter confirmed that Dale had, unfortunately, taken the wrong trail. The Petroglyph Point Trail, while not extremely dangerous, does present certain risks, particularly for those unprepared or unaware of its length and terrain. The trail is generally considered moderately challenging and is a favorite among birders, hikers, and runners. Reviews of the trail often emphasize its ease of navigation and moderate difficulty with rocky sections and undulting terrain. Given these descriptions, it's perplexing why Dale, an experienced hiker, did not return from the trail. When Dale failed to return to the visitor center, a search was initiated. Initial efforts were focused on the cliffs and trails in the vicinity, but no sign of Dale was found. Park spokeswoman Betty Lawrence stated that rescuers searched canyons and trails, but to no avail. Dale's disappearance prompted an immediate and extensive search operation, a rarity in missing person cases in national parks, where searchers often commence days or even weeks after the individual goes missing. In Dale's case, the search began within hours of his absence being noted, thanks in part to his family's prompt reporting and confirmed sighting on the Petroglyph Trail. The search teams, including professional rescue squads, were initially hopeful, given the confirmed sighting and the trail's well-marked nature. The general assumption was that Dale might have suffered an injury on the trail, rather than having left it voluntarily. The Petroglyph Trail's clear path and relative short length supported the expectation of finding him quickly. However, the search proved fruitless. Despite the efforts of foot patrols, dog teams, horseback searchers, and helicopters equipped with thermal imaging technology, no trace of Dale was found. The lack of any scent picked up by search dogs was particularly baffling given the precise location of his last sighting. The mystery deepened with an account from a writer and hiker named Jod Peterson, who was in the park the day following Dale's disappearance. Peterson reported hearing a male voice calling for help during a hike, but received no response to her calls. She wisely chose not to venture off the trail, aware of the risks. When she reported this to the park rangers, they indicated that they had also heard a call for help in that area the previous day. This information, while potentially crucial, did not lead to Dale's discovery. The search for Dale continued for several years with no significant leads or discoveries. In September of 2020, a breakthrough occurred when Dale's remains were found in a remote section of the park based on an anonymous tip from a hiker. The remains were located quite a distance from where he was last seen, having traveled 4.2 miles off the trail. 
The discovery was made in an area that had been extensively searched years earlier, raising questions about how Dale was missing during the initial search efforts. The condition in which Dale's remains were found at the base of a lone tree in a ravine on Chapin Mesa suggested a tragic end to his journey in Mesa Verde National Park. The area, steeped in history and shrouded in mystery, had witnessed the rise and fall of ancient civilizations and now bore witness to another unsolved mystery, the disappearance and death of Mitchell Dale Sterling. The circumstances surrounding his final moments remain unknown, a reminder of the unpredictability and inherent dangers of the wilderness. The Disappearance of Julia Christine Devlin, a distinguished 55-year-old University of Virginia lecturer in Shenandoah National Park in July of 2021, is a deeply troubling and unresolved mystery. Julia was an esteemed figure in her academic field, holding a bachelor's degree in economics and a master's in Arab studies with economics from George Mason University. Her impressive academic journey also led her to the Brookings Institute, where she served as a non-resident senior fellow. Julia's last known whereabouts were captured on CCTV on July 14th of 2021 as she entered Shenandoah National Park in her white Lexus sedan. The park, renowned for its sprawling landscapes and natural beauty, would become the center of a perplexing investigation following her disappearance. Her failure to report to work and a sudden break in communication with her family members raised immediate alarms. The situation turned critical when, a few days after her last sighting, Julia's car was found in wrecked condition along Skyline Drive in the northern part of the Shenandoah Park. The positioning of the vehicle, suggesting it was headed towards a cliff face, indicated a serious accident, and an urgent search for Julia commenced. This intensive search operation was mobilized, with involvement from the Shenandoah National Park Service, the FBI, the MPS Investigative Services Branch, local law enforcement, search and rescue teams, and numerous volunteers. This collaborative effort saw the deployment of extensive land and air search resources, including specialized dog teams. The teams combed through the park, dedicating hundreds of man-hours in their quest to find Julia. Despite the exhaustive search efforts, it wasn't until 10 days after her disappearance that Julia's body was discovered in a remote, challenging area of the park, characterized by steep and rugged terrain. The location of her body, found only about 600 meters from her abandoned car, raised questions about the circumstances leading up to her death. Her remains were initially identified on site, with later confirmation by the Office of the Medical Examiner in Augusta County. Yet, the details regarding the cause of death, including whether there was any foul play, remained undisclosed by the authorities at the time of their reporting. The investigation into Julia's death continued, with no further comments made by the medical examiner's office or the other agencies involved. Julia's disappearance and the subsequent discovery of her body in such proximity to her car in the vast wilderness of Shenandoah National Park present a bewildering case. The lack of clear answers about what transpired during those crucial days in July adds a layer of uncertainty to the grief of this tragedy. The academic community, her colleagues, her loved ones were all left mourning the loss of a respected scholar and esteemed individual while grappling with the unresolved questions surrounding her untimely demise. In June of 2017, the story of Mike Peterson, an avid and experienced hiker, unfolded in the wild expanse of Yellowstone National Park. His decision to embark on a solo hike in a familiar terrain was characteristic of his adventurous spirit and deep appreciation for the great outdoors. Mike, well prepared and attuned to the challenges of the wilderness, set off wearing an orange hunting vest, armed with bear spray, food, and a firearm, essentials for navigating the unpredictable wilderness of Yellowstone. Throughout his hike, Mike remained in contact with his girlfriend, Bonnie Singer, via text message. 
They had meticulously planned their day, with Bonnie set to pick him up at 6 p.m. They looked forward to an evening together in the serene setting of the park. However, this idyllic plan was abruptly interrupted when Mike failed to show up at the designated time. Bonnie, stationed at the agreed-upon location, waited anxiously, but Mike was nowhere to be seen. Her anxiety escalated into dread when, at 7.20 p.m., the quiet of the park was broken by the sound of four gunshots from the woods. Realizing the severity of the situation, Bonnie immediately notified the local sheriff's office, setting in motion a significant search and rescue operation that began at 10 p.m. The response to Mike's disappearance was swift and comprehensive. Over 40 individuals, including search and rescue experts, canine units, and helicopters were mobilized to scour the park for any trace of him. However, their efforts were hampered by challenging weather conditions, including severe storms that intermittently grounded the helicopters, limiting their ability to search from the air. For three days, the search teams braved the rugged terrain of West Yellowstone, a landscape known for its stunning beauty, but also its inherent dangers. The searchers covered vast areas, combing through dense forests, steep ravines, and along the banks of rivers and creeks. Despite their exhaustive efforts, there was no sign of Mike. On the third day of the search, the teams made a grim discovery. Mike's body was found in Beaver Creek, marking a tragic end to an extensive search. Compounding the mystery, Mike's orange vest and bear spray were located half a mile away from where his body was found. His pack and firearm were discovered at another separate location. The dispersal of his belongings across different areas hinted at an unusual and possibly frantic series of events leading up to his death. The lack of bear tracks near Mike's belongings and body discounted the possibility of a wildlife attack, leaving more questions than answers. The sheriff's office concluded that Mike might have tried to cross Beaver Creek when conditions were safe, but upon his return, found the creek transformed by snowmelt, resulting in a dangerous surge of water. They speculated that he was swept away by the sudden increase in water flow. However, this theory raised further questions. Why would Mike leave his essential survival gear scattered and not seek higher ground for cellular reception to inform Bonnie of his change in plans? Mike Peterson's story is a sobering reminder of the unpredictable nature of wilderness areas like West Yellowstone. It underscores the importance of preparedness, the necessity of constant vigilance, and the need for a well-thought-out plan, especially when embarking on solo adventures in such environments. His disappearance and untimely demise in the stunning yet unforgiving wilderness of Yellowstone leaves a lingering mystery and a lesson about the unforgiving foreseen dangers that even the most experienced hikers can face. As we conclude our journey through these mysterious stories of our nation's beautiful yet often perilous national parks, it's crucial to recognize both the splendor and the risk these natural wonders embody. Each story we've shared today serves as a reminder of the awe-inspiring beauty and the inherent dangers of exploring our national parks. The wilderness of these parks offers breathtaking vistas, serene landscapes, and a chance to connect with nature in its purest form. However, these adventures also come with responsibilities and risks. Hikers and explorers must always be aware of their surroundings, stay on the designated trails, and be prepared for sudden weather changes and challenging terrains. It's essential to carry sufficient water, food, and emergency supplies, and always let someone know your planned route and expected return time. Thank you for watching this entire video. If you've enjoyed the content and found value in these stories, please consider showing your support. You can like, share, and subscribe to the channel, and don't forget to hit the notification bell so you don't miss out on any new and upcoming videos. Stay safe. Stay curious, and until next time, keep exploring the mysteries that surround us.